Welcome to the latest um, What's Happening in Black British History. Um, we've been running these workshops since what, 2013, Miranda, is that right? Yeah, 2014, October 14, 2014. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and um, obviously under the current circumstances, we can't do what we, what we like to do, which is to take the workshop um, on the road, if you, if you like, around the UK. But the fact that we're online provides a wonderful opportunity to connect with uh, scholars around the world. And uh, we're, we're absolutely delighted to have um, speakers from Pakistan with us today, from, from the US. Um, and I know people, other people are calling in from, from other parts of the world. So welcome everyone. Um, it's really great. It's really great to see you and have you with us. Um, as Miranda said, you know the standard um, protocols for this sort of meeting apply. Please make sure your microphones are muted. That's that's the key thing. Um, you can um, turn your videos off if if you want, but um, I know speakers sometimes find it useful to have a kind of a friendly face or two. Um, to to look at um, because otherwise you sort of you feel like you're speaking into the void sometimes. Um, please use chat um, to pose a question. Or as I'm, I'm going to be chairing this first session, which will run throughout the morning. Um, uh, so if you'd like to come in and ask a, a question in person, um, just. Use chat to say, Philip. I'd like to. I'd like to come in at some point, and I'll, I'll bring you in. But, but also, um, and and this might be the easier way. Just pose a question on chat, and you can you can write your question anytime, just as it's occurring to you. That's that's a great thing. As a speaker is speaking, don't feel you have to wait until the very end. And um, uh, yeah, so. We'll, we've got quite a long first session. Um, David Killingray, from uh, a fellow of uh, our Institute, Commonwealth Studies, is going to be talking about early Pan-African endeavours in the Black Atlantic world, uh, 1890 to 1912. Uh, uh, but probably we will start with um, Kithoa John from the University of Chichester, talking about militant diaspora, the International African Service Bureau and the Caribbean Labour Rebellions, um, followed by Ellie Kramer Taylor from King's College London on the West Indian Federation and the Caribbean diaspora in Britain. Uh, we'll then probably have a little break uh, just for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and then we have two uh, speakers. Uh, Iman Iqbal and Aruba Ali from uh, Kined College for Women in Lahore, Pakistan, who will be presenting, and Shireen uh, Mushtaq will be supporting them at the at the Q and A, uh, talking about racism, structural violence, the case of uh, British African Caribbean people, and we'll finish that session with uh, Robin Bunce uh, from Cambridge talking about black sections in the Labour Party, 1983 to seven, apartheid colonialism and understandings of anti-racism in Britain. Um, we'll, uh, we'll take those papers together and then hopefully we'll have about at least half an hour for questions, Q&A, uh, before we, we break for lunch at, at one o'clock. So, um, uh, if I can ask Sewa to, to come in and present first, uh, welcome and welcome, welcome to you all. Right. Okay, Kesewa, I've been pronouncing your name wrong for two years now. <laughs> um, are you ready to go? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to kick off today. Scholars have long recognised the 1930s as a decade which is a major turning point in Caribbean history. The 1930s were tumultuous for the entire Caribbean, English, French, Spanish, and Dutch speaking. From the Bahamas in the north of the region, to Guyane at the southernmost tip. 
Caribbean colonial territories and their centuries old power structures shook throughout the 1930s and well into World War II and beyond, as workers downed tools and demanded social as well as industrial change in phenomena historian O. Nigel Bolland has termed the Caribbean labor rebellions. And the first slide, if we jump. is a quote that I hope isn't as difficult to read on your screen as it is on mine. Um, it's taken from the Barbados Observer, the local paper there, which was very supportive of the labor rebellions and the working class clause in general. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the rebellions in Barbados, but this gives a real picture of what kind of disarray, disorder and violence kind of took over the region in different waves, um, over, in particularly intensely over a three year period. In this paper, I'm going to offer a little background on the Labour Rebellions and then introduce the Negro Welfare, Cultural and Social Association, one of the most prominent organisers of the strikes in Trinidad. I'll then explain the link between the NWCSA and the International African Service Bureau and some of the advocacy the Bureau undertook as it sought to publicise the causes of the rebellion and demand redress. I jump to the next slide. This is a classic description of the Caribbean labor rebellions, which typically excludes the rebellions in the neighboring French colonial Caribbean Isles. I'm not gonna read it because I find it strange to read quotes, um, but it's just there for you to see how many different places are involved, how much, um, how much violence is kind of part of it. And yeah, this is a, this is a classic description of what the, the labor rebellions really were if you're not familiar with Caribbean history. The decade also coincided with 100 years since the abolition of African enslavement in the English speaking Caribbean. And the uprisings were initially industrial in nature because the mass of the population had inherited labor conditions only marginally improved since emancipation and social relations which remained largely unaltered. The labor rebellions of the 1930s thus represented a new fundamental irrevocable disruption. In countries across the region, people collectively demanded change. They nominated representatives and they sought meetings with the governor or the administrator. They sought meetings with their employers and they collectively withdrew their labor. Shocking levels of absolute poverty for the poor while the elite lived in world-class luxury was the underlying cause of the labor rebellions. But the trigger, particularly in the English-speaking Caribbean, <clears throat> was the Ethiopian Solidarity Campaign. In his 1930 pamphlet assessing the working and living conditions of black people globally, called the life and struggles of Negro toilers, George Padmore wrote this. And this I will read next time. In no section of the black world, are class lines more sharply defined than in the Caribbean colonies. Throughout all of the West Indies, one is confronted with a shocking spectacle of whole populations living on the verge of starvation. In the rural districts, we find thousands of pauperized, downtrodden natives huddled together in company-owned barracks on the sugar plantations or scattered around the countryside in mud shacks. Forced to labor long hours on the smallest pittances, the West Indian worker is scarcely able to provide himself with the most elementary necessities of life. The picture is of Elma Francois. She emigrated to Trinidad from St. Vincent in 1919, and there she worked as a laundress and quickly joined the Trinidad Working Men's Association, which was then led by Andrew Arthur, AKA Captain Priani. Although paternalistic in, a paternalistic, although paternalistic in approach, Cipriani was an early champion of workers' rights on, in his advocacy on behalf of the barefoot man. More interested in facilitating workers fighting for their own rights, Elmer built an organization which went on to rival the TWA. By the end of the decade, she was the undisputed leader of what we now call the Negro Welfare Cultural Social Association. An anti-imperialist Marxist grouping which actively recruited women and embedded gender equality into the ethos of the organization itself. Elmer Francois and the Negro Welfare Culture and Social Organization led hundreds of workers on hunger marches 
in the Trinidad capital, Port of Spain. She created registers, they created a register of the unemployed, and they crucially organized support for former NWCSA member Uriah Butler when the workers are from the Trinidad's oil fields in the south, sorry, when the workers from the oil fields in the south of Trinidad, who he led to strike in June 1937. Yes, that's what I said. He led them to strike in 1937. And the NWCSA helped to turn that movement into a general strike, which lasted three weeks. Elma Francois was probably the most prominent woman in the Caribbean labor movement in the 1930s, and one of the few Caribbean women to be recognized as a leader of an internationalist left-wing organization, which she directed politically and organizationally. As the name hints, the, NW, the organization had links with the UK's Negro Welfare Association. Elma Francois had inserted cultural and social into the title in order to appeal to women who were more accustomed to participating in less explicitly political organizations. The link to the UK's Negro Welfare Association was through Jim Headley, the original NWA, the Negro Welfare Association, was founded through the Communist Party of Great Britain around 1931 by two Barbadians, Arnold Ward and Chris Brathwaite. One of the earlier outspoken organizations in the UK advocating for Britain's black communities and black workers worldwide. Research by Christian Hogsburn reveals that Jim Headley had worked closely with Brathwaite and with George Padmore. At its second meeting, Headley was elected secretary of the Siemens Minority Movement's Committee of Colonial Seamen an organization set up by the Communist Party of Great Britain for the International Trade Union Committee of Negro Workers, also known as the Black International. Headley also set up the International Seamen's Club in Poplar, a few miles from Brathwaite's base in Stepney. Several black organizations in Britain in the interwar years were affiliated to the international communist movement. And I'll go to the next quote. Oh. <laughs> So it doesn't seem to want to hmm, just resume. I think we've gone back rather than forward there. Apologies, Kesua. Can you still see the screen? I can see your screen, yeah. And is it on the um, Elma Francois slide at the moment? Uh, no, the one I'm looking at is the first slide, the uh, Barbados Observer quote. Okay. So on my screen, it's frozen on the Elma Francois slide. That's fine. I can keep going. It's actually not that long a quote anyway. Um, okay. You keep going and I'll try and bring it up again in just a moment. That's fine. Thank you. So condition number eight was the reason why there were so many people affiliated. And I'm going to read condition number eight and explain what that was. Quote, a particularly marked and clear attitude on the question of the colonies and oppressed nations is necessary on the part of the communist parties of those countries whose bourgeoisies are in possession of colonies and oppress other nations. Parties in countries whose bourgeoisie possess colonies and oppress other nations must pursue a most well-defined and clear-cut policy in respect of the colonies and oppressed nations. Any party wishing to join the Third International must ruthlessly, must ruthlessly expose the colonial machinations of the imperialist, imperialists of its own country, must support indeed, not merely in word, every colonial liberation movement, demand expulsion of, expulsion of its compatriot imperialists from the colonies, inculcate in the hearts of the workers of its own country an attitude of true brotherhood with the working population of the colonies and the oppressed nations, and conduct systematic agitation among the armed forces against all oppression of the colonial peoples. Of the conditions of admission <clears throat> to the Communist International, condition number eight, strong wording, explicitly recognized the equal humanity of people from colonized countries. Furthermore, it also asserted their right to political liberty from a domination which the mainstream political discourse of the day described as primarily benevolent, the white man's burden or tutelage as the League of Nations covenant labeled it. As a condition of acceptance of the Comintern, 
Condition number eight also placed a burden on all communist parties to support people from the colonies who were agitating for an end to colonial rule. This commitment to anti-imperialism and anti-racism shared across national or imperial borders made communism and Soviet Russia politically appealing to those colonial subjects determined to organize for freedom, including Africans and people of African descent in the Caribbean, Latin America and North America and in Europe. For them, the ITU-CNW, the International Trade Union Committee of Negro Workers, was created. This was the com communist international apparatus which George Padmore led. In 1934, Jim Headley was back in Trinidad and with his comrades, Elmer Francois, Dudley Mann and Jim Barrett, he co-founded the National Unemployed Movement, which a year later became the Negro Welfare Cultural and Social Association. Although Europe's black population was comparatively small in the 1930s, among them were a group of activists who advocated fearlessly, ceaselessly, and effectively for justice for people in and from colonized countries, and with whom the NWCSA <clears throat> had a relationship. The British-based response to the Caribbean labor rebellions provides a clear example of their transnational collaboration. In late 1937, a security services officer mentioned in a confidential memo that the speed of the response to the International African Service Bureau and the accuracy of the information about the uprisings in the Caribbean was so thorough that the colonial office were not entirely convinced that the Bureau hadn't had a hand in organizing them in the first place. A secret report into the investigations into one, political influences in connection with the Trinidad labor disturbance in 1937 and two, Com communist activities affecting industrial interests generally in the British colonies was therefore commissioned. The Bureau's response had certainly been rapid. The issue of Africa and the World published in London on the 14th of August 1937 was only the People Papers third edition and it dedicated a section to strikes in the West Indies. In addition to a detailed report on the unrest in Barbados just two weeks earlier, the article informed readers of a public meeting in London, held on the 9th of August. At that meeting, various members of the executive committee of the Bureau, George Padmore, CLR James, and Chris Blackway in particular, Arnold Ward of the Negro Welfare Association, and Reginald Bridgman of the League Against Imperialism, all spoke in support of the Caribbean's working class. The meeting passed the following resolution. And Joanna, do we have a quote? Can we see it? Yay, okay. And I'll give it a quick read. This meeting of British and colonial workers held at Trafalgar Square on Sunday the 9th of August under the auspices of the International African Service Bureau sends fraternal greetings to the toiling workers of Trinidad and Barbados and of other West Indian colonies and pledges its wholehearted support in their heroic struggle for the right to trade unionism, collective bargaining, and general economic and social advancement. It condemns the repressive measures adopted by the representative of vested interests in these islands in trying to prevent these native workers from securing their legitimate demands for increased wages and shorter hours and calls upon the colonial office to institute inquiries into the labor conditions in the West Indies. The prelude to that article stated, since the publication of the last issue of Africa in the World, labor unrest continues to sweep over the West Indies which indicated that either or both of the previous issues had, had brought the news to reason the UK of the uprisings in Trinidad. Two weeks after this, in late August, Africa and the World published a special West Indian edition. Contextualizing, excuse me, contextualizing the background and events immediately preceding the labor rebellions, which had shaken Barbados and Trinidad in June and July respectively, the special edition also elaborated on the response of the local representatives of the British state. The presenting of events, particularly injustice in the colonies to the wider British public, the identification of likely allies and the sending of resolutions to the concerned authorities was by 1937, a well-established and effective campaign strategy for the Caribbean radicals in Europe, as was the use of a regular produced publication to disseminate information, to educate, and in today's parlance, to create a sense of community amongst those people struggling for justice in the colonial Caribbean on both sides of the Atlantic. The International African Service Bureau were people in close proximity to the center of imperial power, 
who were determined <clears throat> to use that position to advocate for justice for their native lands. This was a continuation of George Padmore's earlier work. In 1930, the Bureau's unofficial leader had been head of the Communist International's Negro Bureau of the Profinsan, which was the division of the international communist movement concerned with developing trade unionism globally. A large part of Padmore's job had been to understand the conditions of black workers worldwide, to write for them by the Negro Worker newspaper, which he edited, and to connect with those black activists hoping to improve them. But when a Dajin emigrated to the US initially, Padmore had been based in Europe since 1929, living first in Russia, then Austria, before settling in Weimar, Germany in 1931. He lived in Hamburg until just weeks after Adolf Hitler's 1933 ascent to the German Chancellorship, when as a British colonial citizen and therefore a foreigner, he was arrested and deported to the UK. Padmore went immediately to Paris, where he spent some 18 months working among the left-wing and pan-Africanist organizations of the early 1930s. Despite his years heading up the Communist International's Negro Bureau, it was in Paris, where in Padmore's own words, he confessed to having been most impressed by the sophistication of black political organizing. In a 1934 letter to African-American W.B. Du Bois, he wrote the following, well, the quote that you can see on your screens. It should be noted that the speed of the London's base group's response was particularly impressive because in 1937, the Bureau was a new organization. It had been established only three months earlier, effectively replacing the International African Friends of Ethiopia, which had been co-founded by CLR James and Amy Ashwood Garvey, and through which they had co-coordinated the London-based Ethiopian Solidarity Campaign. But George Padmore was certainly not new to international nor internationalist political organizing. As the Ethiopian Solidarity Campaign de-intensified, the executive regrouped and reorient reoriented their energies. The second issue of, of Africa and the World included a report on the emergency meeting of Trinidad's Legislative Council, which was called to inquire into the cause of the strike, unquote. The article highlighted that the governor criticized the island's big businessmen on the way they had been exploiting their native workers. It also highlighted the colonial secretary Nankavel's unexpectedly supportive comments. Echoing criticisms of Trinidad's plantocracy, his frank words had seemingly elicited cheers at the meeting. He said, the sugar industry was not subsidized by the taxpayers to enable vested interests to reap big profits. profits. It has no right to pay dividends at all unless it pays a fair wage to labor, end quote. Thus going into quite intricate detail, in 1937, Caribbean radicals in London used their newspaper to publicize the workers' revolt in the English-speaking Caribbean and the justice of that cause, which even the governor of Trinidad had acknowledged. In addition to public meetings to raise awareness among the British public and generate solidarity with workers in the Caribbean, the IASB advocated through their contacts with British politicians. Since December 1935, CLR James had been the chair of the Independent Labour Party's Finchie branch, and the Bureau enjoyed a close relationship with many ILP MPs. They contributed regularly to the ILP journal New Leader, where they made the case for colonial freedom. Through their relationship with, symp with sympathetic members of parliament, the IASB were able to have the issues of working class Caribbean people addressed directly by the British government. Between June 1937 and July 1938, there were MPs like David Abrams, David Adams, excuse me, Arthur Creech Jones, Benjamin Riley, and Reginald Sorensen. Over 50 questions were, paced, were posed to the Secretary of State for the Colonies, which focused all on working and living conditions in the Caribbean and what the government was or wasn't doing about improving them. It is a testament to the effectiveness of their advocacy that a wide enough section of the British public became interested in conditions of the colonies, and MPs such as the Liberal James de Rothschild also began asking questions. On the 5th of August 1938, the Royal Warrant was signed, which, which officially instructed Lord Moyne to investigate social and economic conditions in Barbados, British Guyana, British Conjuras, Jamaica, the Leeward Islands, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Windward Islands, and matters connected therewith to make recommendations. This was almost a year to the day after the Trafalgar Square IASB rally had called for an investigation into labour conditions in British, Britain's Caribbean colonies 
following the Labour rebellions in Trinidad and Barbados, and after over 50 questions had been put before the House of Commons. The Moyne Commission submitted their report in December 1939. Considered so damning that it could be used as propaganda by Nazi Germany, publication was therefore suppressed until the end of World War II. The ISB's advocacy for the Caribbean from their London base continued well into the 1940s, and when it morphed into the Pan-African Federation, which organized the 1945 Pan-African Congress at Manchester, the NWCSA sent a member to represent it. After the death of their leader, Noah Francois, in 1944, the NWCSA also took a new form. Her comrades, Christina King and Jim Barrett, worked closely with a young activist, John LaRose, in the workers' freedom movement, who, after he moved to England, established New Beacon Books, which, in 1988, published Rhoda Reddick's book, Elma Francois, the NWCSA, and the Workers' Struggle for Change in the Caribbean, in the 1930s. Uncovering that history, and thus continuing the tradition of a militating diaspora. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, that was that was wonderful. I'm sorry that things got off to a slightly shaky start, and thank you, um, Kisawa, for, for for rescuing us with such a such a wonderful opening to to the conference. Okay, Ellie, would you like to would you like to go next because you were sort of. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. That would be that would be wonderful. Okay, I am ready. Um, great. So, uh, thanks everybody for today. Um, Kesselwell, your uh, presentation, by the way, was really really interesting. So, thank you for sharing that. Um, so, I am going to talk um, about the uh, the West Indian Federation and how it influenced or um, how the Caribbean diaspora in Britain kind of engaged with the federation. Um, and this presentation will. Um, examine kind of how, how Britain's Caribbean in community in the late 1950s um, experienced uh, the emergence of the West Indian Federation in 1958, arguing that um, a consideration of how the diaspora experienced this particular event kind of complicates um, and enhances our understanding of Caribbean activism in Britain more generally, as well as um, the kind of transnational connections that existed between Britain um, and the Caribbean in this period. So, um, in um, in late 1950s Britain, um, it's kind of generally been acknowledged by scholars that there was um, a noticeable pro proliferation of Caribbean activism and Caribbean organisations um, that um, specifically focused on um, kind of the Caribbean and Caribbean independence specifically. Um, and on this slide we can see some of these organizations um, and events that were kind of formed and founded in 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 this period so in 1957 for example there was the west indian workers and students association um, in 1958 uh, there was the formation of the west indian gazette and afro asian news and the british caribbean association as well and then in 1959 there was of course the the, the caribbean carnival um, and that there was such a proliferation in this period has it has been noted by you know quite a few few scholars such as Carol Boyce Davies and um, Edward Pilfington and and Bill mm. Schwartz as well and um, in particular the West Indian the kind of establishment of the West Indian Gazette and the Caribbean Carnival um, are both often used as examples of um, of this kind of uh, political and cultural West Indian presence in Britain that was really coming to the fore at the time. Um, however, this, this mobilization amongst the Caribbean population has really only been considered within the domestic context um, of the British Isles. Um, so, for example, um, Boyce Davies and Pilkington have both argued that the racial violence of um, the racial violence that was experienced by the, the Afro-Caribbean community in the late 1950s specifically um, the race riots in Notting Hill and, Not and Nottingham in 1958 and the, um, the murder of Kelso Cochrane, Cochrane in Notting Hill in 1959, um, kind of the aftermath actually, which um, you can see um, in this picture. Um, these have kind of been seen as, um, so this racial violence has kind of been seen as one of the key factors in stimulating the Caribbean activism that was witnessed in this period. Um, in her biography of Claudia Jones, for example, Boyce Davies 
explains that most of the people that she interviewed for the book agreed that this series of inter, um, incidents, so the race riots and, and the murder of Cochrane, um, provided the catalyst for putting in place what she calls um, a more self-directed and culturally and politically aware community. Um, now, although there isn't kind of any doubt that such racist violence and aggression had a galvanizing effect on the West Indian population in Britain, we should also um, consider the global imperial context, um, in particular parallel to the, the infamous uh, race riots in 1958, the West Indian Federation actually came into fruition. Um, and um, so the West Indian Federation, it was essentially a, a political union in the British Caribbean, which was made up of uh, the majority of uh, British, Car uh, British Caribbean territories. And it was one that, you know, just despite its many flaws, which we won't really go into here, was at the time often equated with the achievement of a West Indian nationhood for many people in the Caribbean. And on this slide, you can kind of see that uh, paraphernalia that's often associated with the formation of a nation. So there's a, a West, Indian Federa uh, West Indian Federation stamp, for example, and also a, a coat, of, coat of arms. Um, so we should really therefore, you know, ask what the impact of the emergence of, of the West Indian Federation, the emergence of what was essentially a, a West Indian nation for many people, had on the, the Caribbean diaspora in Britain, particularly in um, in a period when they were supposedly supposedly becoming more culturally and uh, politically aware and organised. Um, so in the next few slides, I'm going to look at the literature produced by two organisations I've already touched on, the West Indian Gazette and, the, um, and its parent organisation, the West Indian Workers and Students Association. And hopefully we'll see that you know, the Federation was actually quite influential on these organisations. And in doing so, we'll also hopefully expand our understanding of the Caribbean experience in Britain in this period, but also the uh, the transnational experience that, that was decolonization. Um, so on this slide, uh, you should be able to see a quote from the West Indian Gazette's um, annual general meeting that was held in 1958, which says, uh, three months ago, coinciding with the, West in with the West Indian nationhood, the West Indian Gazette was born. And um, again, in, in 1958, the Gazette also stated, and that's the, the top quote on this slide, to begin with, our birth one year ago paralleled the inauguration of the West Indies Federation, the first step towards West Indian nationhood. So firstly, these, these two quotes really show us that, um, the, that the Gazette was emerging as a, a prominent publication in Britain at precisely the same time the, the Federation was coming into, was kind of becoming a new nation. And I don't necessarily think that um, that these two events, these two events are a coincidence. The federation was formed in January 1958, and the Gazette's first ever publication was in March of the same year, so just two months afterwards. Um, and at least the, from what we can see here, the Gazette at least saw itself as having some kind of significant relationship with the federation. Um, and as you can see, this with the second quote um, at the bottom of this slide in an article called 80,000 Good Reasons, in which the Gazette basically explained its, its purpose as an organization. It stated, as a West Indian nation comes into being, we want more news and fuller news from home. So in a way, the Gazette not only had a, a kind of general awareness of the um, formation, oh, sorry, I've just lost my notes slightly. Um, so sorry, so in a way, the um, the Gazette not only had a, a general awareness of the formation of the Federation, but here it's also kind of implying that it was responding almost to a demand for information from the Caribbean by the, the Caribbean community in Britain, um, which also kind of implies as well just that, that the Federation was clearly a, a significant event for the, for the broader Caribbean community. So therefore, you know, when we're when we're looking at motivations and, and stimulus for um, organisations like the West Indian Gazette and events that were significant um, for the Caribbean community in Britain more broadly, we can see that the domestic context, so um, kind of um, anti-immigration poli um, politics or or racial violence, weren't 
they don't necessarily give us the the full story and that the federation at this period of time was also um in the forefront of um of the minds of, of much of the the caribbean population um so uh, the west indian workers and students association which was actually the kind of parent organization of the west indian gazette was also quite um, highly engaged with the with the federation as well, and you can see from this quote, which was from their inaugural um, executive committee meeting in 1957, they stated, uh, "As British West Indians, we are deeply concerned with what happens at home as our people move toward greater self-government, federation, and dominion status." And whilst kind of declaring that they were deeply concerned about the Federation, the West Indian Workers and Students Association also stated that um, we will do everything to support the struggles of our people to achieve this end. Um, so as the Federation emerged, it, you know, it, it therefore clearly influenced Caribbean organisations in Britain. But importantly, there was also clearly a transnational relationship um, established between um, or at least it just demonstrates that demonstrates the the transnational relationship that um, that was happened that uh, existed between the diaspora in Britain and um, the Caribbean community back in in the Caribbean, um, and the excitement and engagement demonstrated by the Gazette by the uh, the Workers and Students Association um, really shows us that you know just because the diaspora was kind of spatially distant from the Caribbean. Um, that des that distance didn't necessarily impact um, their kind of concern with Caribbean politics. Um, and this this kind of transnational dynamic is also demonstrated in in how the West Indian Workers Organization specifically believed it could proactively support and contribute to the success of the Federation. Um, and in fact, it framed uh, British West Indians as actually having a responsibility to support the Federation. Um, so as it stated in 1958, um, in present circumstances, West Indians, as a self-respecting people duty bound to their homeland, must contribute their share to this great struggle. So here we can see that um, the Workers and Students Association, you know, despite being on the other side of the Atlantic, felt that part of its purpose as an organization uh, was to support and contribute to the movement of independence that was happening back in the Caribbean. And this is where you can really start to see evidence of the Federation um, influencing the types of activism used um, by Britain's Caribbean population. Um, then here I'm going to try and um, demonstrate specifically how the emergence of the Federation and the kind of political discourse that um, that surrounded it helped define Caribbean activism in Britain in this period. And in doing so, hopefully also outline again the kind of the transnational connections between the two locations. Um, so I mean, for, from its very beginning, there were there were quite a lot of doubts about the future of the Federation, which were widespread throughout the Caribbean and its diaspora. Um, in particular, there were concerns about uh, limit, the limits of its sovereignty. Um, for example, the Caribbean people had decided um, that Chagaramas, which is an area of Trinidad, would be the capital um, of the Federation. However, this request was actually denied because um, the area was being leased to the Americans um, as a naval base. So you know, immediately many people felt that their self-determination was already being curtailed. Um, but as well as this, there was also quite a lot of large concerns about the federal economy, um, which were again, these were expressed both in the Caribbean, but also in Britain as well. And, and you can see um, this quote on the screen at the top from the Workers and Students Association, which stated, um, the essential point here is that economically the federation is in a poor state and with a budget of um, nine million pounds which is about a third of the entire budget of trinidad it can hardly be expected to move pebbles and you know even within the pages of the gazette this this worry about the strength of the federal economy came to the came to the fore as well um, um as the gazette reported in in march 1958 a large concern revolves on the hard questions of economic solvency of this new federal structure. So we can see here that there was, you know, there was quite a lot of concern about the Federation floating around. And it's in this context that activists in Britain tried to um, try to do what they can to support the, the federal union. 
Um, Billy Strachan, who was a prominent Caribbean activist and thinker in Britain, uh, stated of the federal economy, um, stated of the stunted federal, federal economy um, that the problem is so acute that it's the only higher sense of kinsmanship that holds the structure together against such overwhelming odds. Um, for Caribbean activists uh, in Britain, then it, it was maintaining this kin, kinsmanship, this um, it was the uniting of the population, which was the best way for them to support the Federation. So we can start to see connections between concerns about the future of the Federation um, that were traveling throughout the Caribbean and throughout its diaspora and the goals set by Caribbean activists in Britain. Um, the West Indian Workers and Students Association, for example, thought that you know, to solve the problems of West Indians, we really need to start by uniting uh, West Indians, individuals and or organizations. So again, we can see how um, the politicization of Britain's West Indian community in the late 1950s can possibly be seen as a direct response to imperial politics and, and federal politics in the Caribbean, as well as the um, kind of domestic issues. And by recognizing you know, the importance of the Federation on the Caribbean diaspora, other prominent events amongst Britain's Caribbean population also start, on, start to take on a, a slightly different meaning. Um, so so as, the, as the Gazette, the West Indian Gazette stated itself, um, about itself actually, it said it was originally conceived in the inaugural conference of the West Indian Workers and Students Association as an instrument for helping to build a united movement at home roused by the Federation. Um, so what this quote is actually kind of saying is that part of the reasons that the Gazette um, was created in the first place was to help unite Caribbean people in Britain. And if we know that the, that building unity was a, a response to concerns about the weakness of the Federation, then we can see how influential federal politics might have been in, um, in defining activism amongst Britain's Caribbean community in this period. And again, recognizing the importance of the Federation allows us to raise um, questions about him, how important events in Britain, such as the Caribbean Carnival, which was um, first established in 1959. Um, so again, you know, the Caribbean Carnival is, is generally understood by historians to have been established as a re response to racial hostility towards Britain's black community. Um, and you know, obviously without dismissing the important, uh, importance of those kinds of events, a relationship between the Carnival and the Federation can still be identified. Um, in the, um, the programme that was produced for the first Carnival, Claudia Jones actually wrote that, um, and it's a, that's the quote at the bottom of the screen. Um, she said, a pride in being West Indian is, undoubt is undoubtedly at the root of this unity, a pride that has, an or has its origin in the drama of nation, na nascent nationhood, and that pride encompasses the genesis of the nation itself. Um, so this mention of unity in the context of the, the concerns that plagued the Federation, um, and given that we know that unity was kind of seen as a, a method for combating these concerns, kind of shows us that the formation of the carnival may also have actually been in a, partly an attempt at unifying West in, the West Indian population in support for the Federation as well. The feeling of, um, of unity that Claudia Jones saw as surrounding the carnival was for her, um, like she said, stimulated by a pride in the genesis of the nation itself. So, you know, the, a pride stimulated by the creation of the West Indian Federation. Um, so although I, you know, I wouldn't presume to say that the Federation was the Federation caused the carnival directly, it's important to consider the context of politics happening in the Caribbean and how they might have influenced um, the Caribbean diaspora. Um, so to, to conclude, um, a consideration of how, um, how British West Indians engage with the West Indian Federation encourages us to reconsider the traditional narratives that determine um, the Caribbean experience in Britain, but also what stimulated Caribbean activism and the, the pro some of the prominent events for the community in the late 1950s. Although the West Indian Federation had ultimately failed by 1962, we should remember that when it um, when it emerged, it was framed by some, you know, as a step towards nationhood. And so we shouldn't, you know, retrospectively dismiss the impact that this might have had on on the Caribbean population at the time. 
Um, you know, what considering the relationship between the diaspora and the Caribbean also shows is that there were clear transnational connections between the two communities. So news and opinion about the Federation and its future had the power to shape the behaviour of West Indians in Britain. And, you know, potentially this also um, allows us to draw conclusions about the process of decolonization itself, which obviously you know, was at its high point in, in this period in the late 1950s. Um, and that was um, ultimately an experience which you know, transcended all corners of the, of the British Empire and the achievement of a union like the Federation um, as part of the ending of empire um, held meaning for Caribbean people, including those in the diaspora. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And Ellie, you're, you're working on a, a PhD on, on, on this at the, at the moment? Uh, yes, kind of. Well, I literally just started my PhD like two weeks ago. Um, wow. But yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, that's great. I mean, it's fantastic that, that you're able to present Thanks. something, you know. It's, it's really fascinating. And, and is it, are you kind of going to be exploring these links in your PhD? Um, ho hopefully. So yeah. the, the topic is still a little bit up in, in the air. Okay, I'm yeah. interested in yeah. um, those kind of transnational links between the diaspora and not just the federation, but those kind of federal non-national structures like the Commonwealth as well, for example. So that's kind of what I'm Wow. To, um, well, con congratulations. That's, and David, David Killingray, in fact, um, uh, some, some time ago produced the um, British documents on the end of empire volume on the West Indies, didn't you, David? I did, with Steve Ashton, yes. Yeah. A long time ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure David is very interested in this, you know, topic himself. Yeah, are, you, are, you, are, you, um, are you ready to go? In the years 1890 to about 1910, 1912, Pan-African sentiment briefly blossomed and then faded. And what I want to do in this paper is to offer some new ideas as to its causes, course and consequences. And I'll do this by presenting a few questions. First of all, what is Pan-Africanism? I did put up on my screen a PowerPoint presentation, a modern quotation from my friend Hakim Adi, in which he defines Pan-Africanism. And I don't see any reason for disagreeing with that. It uh, resonates with the views in the 1890s that although Pan-Africanism meant different things to different groups of people at different times, it essentially was a sentiment of belonging and identification with Africa as home for those people who were uh, out of Africa as part of the diaspora. It's an imagined identity shaped by an experience of racial oppression. Behind it is uh, quite a strong religious element, providentialism. That great West Indian, but also West African intellectual, E.W. Blyden, in his call to providence to descendants of Africans in America, written in 1862, talks about African-Americans having the role to redeem Africa. Martin has called this evangelical pan-Africanism. And Moses has talked about a missionary Pan-Africanism. So these were the ideas mainly articulated, mainly among the black diaspora in the Americas, but also by occasional voices of the formerly educated elites in Africa. And the one that I cited was Tia Soga, the first South African black to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, who returns with his white wife to South Africa in the late 1850s. And he talks about the so speaking people as having a unity, but he says, I go beyond that to the sons of Ham. And these are the people who inhabit the islands of the West Indies and the Americas. He's talking about the black diaspora and he's talking in clearly pan-Africanistic terms. Now the second question, what galvanized black consciousness in the 1890s? This was a decade in which the interests of black people in the Atlantic world were seriously challenged. 
by imperial excesses, there were wars in Africa, the Pacific and the Caribbean, and a major British war in Southern Africa at the end of the first decade, 1899 to 1902. In West Africa, the role of the formerly educated African elites in affairs of church and state were being steadily undermined. Questions of land were being threatened. In the United States, the gains made by reconstruction had been reversed. The 14th and 15th amendments ignored. Racial discrimination increased with widespread lynching of black people. And the campaign to uh, deal with that, these brutal murders was carried to Britain by a remarkable woman called Ida B. Wells on two occasions in 1893 and 94. So all of this helped to alert not only black people who lived in the uh, black Atlantic world, but also the small black population in Britain, which was probably under 10,000 then, but also quite a lot of white people. And we cannot look at this period without looking at the dimension of white involvement in black ambitions. In the Caribbean in the 1890s, there was a crisis of production as sugar exports declined. And there's a nascent stirring of what I would call patriot sentiment. Similar movements were afoot in West Africa and in the white dominated colonies of Natal and Cape Colony, where there were demands and the voice could be heard, Africa for the Africans both from working class people, but also from the formerly educated elite. In Paris, Sylvain, Benito Sylvain, began publishing his journal La Fraternité in 1890. And at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, African Americans talked in Pan-African terms. Indeed, the phrase Pan-Africanism is probably first used there and it is also echoed in the Atlanta Conference on Africa and the American Negro, which is essentially about missionary endeavor in Africa in 1895. Britain's anti-race discrimination campaign began in 1888 with a, another remarkable woman, Catherine Impey, who published and distributed her monthly anti-caste, caste meaning racial discrimination. This touched uh, Christian and humanitarian bodies of thought in Britain that was already critical of imperialism and denounced racial discrimination as unchristian, sinful, and therefore wrong. You see this in both church and mission organizations, but you see it profoundly in what is little known, and that is the Brotherhood Movement, an organization mainly uh, uh, in non dissenting churches in uh, Britain but also it was international as well. And it welcomed black members and indeed provided platforms for black speakers. A central figure in this is another remarkable figure who's not very well known, and that's J.S. Celestine Edwards, who not only edited Fraternity, which was the journal of the Society for the uh, Recognition of the Brotherhood of Man. So you've got a black man who's editing then journal, but he also edited Lux, the Christian Evidence Society's journal. He's a great um, apologist for Christian Christianity, and he's heard across the, the length and breadth of Britain. He was a, a very good um, public speaker who uh, gained a huge following. People turned out to hear him because he was <coughs> such a fluent speaker. He returns to um, uh, Dominica, his home island, and he dies in 1894 of uh, consumption. So his death removed from the scene of Pan-Africanism in the future, a very important figure who no doubt would have played a prominent role. Let me come to a third question, because the Pan-African Conference of 1900 is held in London and the African Association which is formed in 1897, is also in London. So why London? And who created these first formal Pan-African bodies? 
Well, the African Association was formed in October 1897 in London. The Pan-African Conference met in the city on July 1900. The focus of the African Association was on the British Empire. London was the crossroads of empire, a place to which most transatlantic passenger lines came. If you wanted to come from the Caribbean to Africa or from North America, most of the time you had to come via Europe and particularly Britain. And so Britain is a, a transit point and it's also a point of getting off and doing things while you're here and making connections. And that's a very important element, I think, in this, uh, why London is central to this. But London also has a liberal attitude to the handful of resident non-European subjects. We tend to focus, and it's not difficult to find um, accounts of uh, racial rudeness and discrimination. But many black people who were living in Britain at the time both from African-Americans, but also Africans, commented on what a wonderful place it was to live because they were accorded legal rights, not extended in their colonies of origin, and certainly not for black people in um, the American, in the United States. Most formally educated black elites viewed the British empire also as a force for good, albeit a universal institution that needed to be reformed to provide a racially even playing field. In this aim, they found white ally, allies and sympathizers who were prepared to provide moral and material support. Now, the African Association of 1897 is formed by three people. Henry Sylvester Williams is well known. He was a student at the law courts. Um, Thomas J. Thompson from Sierra Leone, is less well known. And Mrs. Alice Kinlock, who is uh, what was called colored in South Africa, is one of the founders. And she writes to the Quaker Journal, The Friend, saying that today I have helped form an organization called the African Association. And it draws together and provides unity for my people. And Henry Sylvester Williams later on says, Mrs. Williams was the most important and influential voice in creating the African Association. She's a, a woman who has been ignored. Although I have her from cradle to grave, there's still a lot more to find out about this fascinating woman who leaves Britain in 1898, and therefore she's not in London for the Pan-African Conference, and she doesn't come to it either um, for all sorts of reasons. Let me come to a fourth question. What was the purpose of the Pan-African Conference of 1900? Well, the original focus of it was on the British Empire, particularly race relations in Southern Africa. But it has a, a wider remit than that, which is extended to embrace um, a global vision. Um, in some ways, the South African focus is highlighted, I think, by Alice Kinlock writing a book pamphlet called Are South African Diamonds Worth Their Price, which appeared in 1898. And it's a pamphlet which she writes, in fact, under the name of A.V. Alexander, Alice Victoria Alexander, which in fact was her maiden name. And I suspect that she wrote it under her maiden name to give herself anonymity because she talks about the conditions of the uh, workers in the compounds of the diamond mines. And she speaks of it as um, of how they were searched and of sodomy that went on in, in the, on the compound because of lack of women and so on. So she's a woman who confronts this issue and makes it public and she speaks about it on st the stage up and down the country. At the conference itself, most speeches were directed at labor relations and black civil rights in Southern and Central Africa, although there was a strong condemnation of racial discrimination in the empire and also in the USA. Now let's come to another question. Who actually attended the Pan-African Conference and what were their occupations? Well, there were 35 or so black elite figures 
who were invited to attend and speak in this three-day conference, which was held in the Caxton Hall in Westminster on three sweltering days. The temperature was up in the 90s. We have no photographs, but there is a splendid drawing um, in the Daily Graphic, which I would have displayed had it been available. If anyone finds photographs, I will worship you, sort of, for the rest of your lives. That would be wonderful. Most delegates came from North America and the West Indies, plus 10 Africans and three Black Britons, J.R. Archer, Henry, the Reverend Henry Arm Armstrong Smith, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, and I suppose there would have been a fourth, Francis Joseph Peregrino, the son of FZS Peregrino, but he was in prison for theft. Um, he blotted his escutcheon. There were seven black women and seven white women, and some are known to have spoken. It's important not only to sort out who was present, partly because many people who've written about the Pan-African Conference have put people there who simply were not there. And what we're able to do now with digitally indexed newspapers is to try and build up a, I, I like to work on a, a, a tripod of evidence. And if I get two or three references to someone being there, then it's pretty good evidence that, it, that they were there and anything that supports that. I may say that the Pan-African Conference of 1900 gets a wider coverage in the British press than does the 1945 Pan-African um, Congress in uh, Manchester in 1945. Another question to ask is not only who was there, but who was not there? Um, who did not attend either because they could not or they would not? There's no evidence that FZS Peregrino was there. Um, Dr. Theophilus Shaw was a very important figure um, who had been a missionary in Congo and then in Nigeria. And in the late 1890s starts to write a series of books condemning racial imperialism. He's not there and he's probably not there because he didn't have the money. If you stayed in London for three days, it cost you something. Nor is the Reverend Thomas L. Johnson, who writes um, an autobiography, which is in its, was in its eighth edition in 1909. He's not there either. Nor was E.W. Blyden, the great man of Pan-Africanism. And I suspect he wasn't there because he despised mulattoes. And he thought that people who were of mixed race were not the genuine article, and therefore he wasn't going to participate in that kind of event. There are also no working class representatives. Don't be surprised at that. Why should there have been? In fact, the conference, the very idea of Pan-Africanism was unknown to most of the 10,000 black people who lived in Britain at the time and the millions of Africans in Africa and the Americas. I mean, we're talking about something which is pretty small scale um, and doesn't make uh, very many waves. Now, many of those who joined the African Association who came to the Pan-African Conference were students. And that's a poor base on which to build even a, a, a national organization, let alone a global pressure group. So let me go to my next question, six or any eight. What were the ideas and beliefs of those who were active in early Pan-Africanism? My analysis of these people is that most of them were active practicing Christians. Many were ordained. Indeed, the PAC Pan-African Conference meetings opened with prayer. Bishop Alexander Walters of the AMEZ chaired each session. Mandel Crichton, the Bishop of London, formally invited the delegates. And the press commented frequently on the religious nature of some of the proceedings. In short, the event looks to be an extension of the idea of the evangelical or missionary Pan-Africanism to which I referred earlier. The other thing that is important to note is that some of the people who attended and spoke were white. These are among the sympathizers and supporters of these African ambitions. 
knowing what people believed is important because you look at their beliefs and then you look at their actions and to see if they correlate. Let me come to my seventh question. What was the significance of the Pan-African Conference and the body that it created, which was the short-lived Pan-African Association? It had global pretensions, but inherent weaknesses, weaknesses of personality, funds, management. It was not an anti-imperial body. And its vision was often focused on the good points of empire, but they wanted a reformed empire. Shortly after the Pan-African Conference, Henry Sylvester Williams toured the West Indian colonies. He had a very good reception in Jamaica and Trinidad, and there were local bodies that were created, but they were soon merged with indigenous political groups. The same occurred in South Africa, where local political associations were provincial minded. They certainly weren't global minded. And in the US and to a lesser extent in Canada, there were already large, well-established institutions representing African-American churches, commercial, cultural and social activities and interests. In the two black nations of Haiti and Liberia, foreign Pan-African schemes were viewed with deep suspicion. A similar response coming from opinion makers in the British West African colonies. For example, one of my um, screen PowerPoints would have been J. Kaisley Hayford, the great patriot figure. I don't use the word nationalist very often of Africans in this early period, but they're certainly patriots, people who had a concern for the, the area in which they lived, uh, which is often part of the colony in which they lived. And Hayford talked about, um, he writes a fascinating book um, called, um, I'm going to get it off my shelves because it's here, and I'll put it in front. There it is. Ethiero, Ethiopia Unbound, and it's Studies in Race Emancipation. It's a work of fiction, and it appears in 1911. It's well worth reading because he envisages a Pan-African future over the great university at Kumasi in central, what, what was then the Gold Coast, the capital of Ashanti, which would draw scholars from all over the world, African scholars, black scholars. He also envisaged um, Africa as taking its rightful place in the uh, affairs of the nations. And he's talking about a united Africa. He's not talking about just the Gold Coast. So we've got a, a certain amount of hostility towards um, um, black um, uh, ambitions outside. And my last que question, what were there attempts to resuscitate Pan-Africanism in Britain? Well, the side... David, sorry, David, can I ask you to, to sort of wind... I'm winding up now. This is it. Point okay, eight. Okay, um, there, there were various bodies that were formed. They were all pale shadows of the PA uh, African Association, and they didn't really go very far. But they do need to be seen in the context of the Pan-African um, Association that was created. And... There are other white figures, Charles Garnet, for example, who was a congregational minister who traveled to South Africa, who acted as a, a, an agent for African delegations coming to London, helping them smooth the passage, providing accommodation and providing them with platforms. Um, Pan-Africanism more or less fades out and it's only resuscitated um, through the Universal Races Congress in 1911, the Tuskegee meeting in 1912, and of course Mar Marcus Garvey and the work of the UNIA in after 1914. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, great. I oh, originally I'd um, scheduled a little break uh, at, at this point, but we're slightly we're running slightly behind time now um, because of some technical hiccups. Um, and I, I thought maybe we could go straight into the next uh, presentation if uh, Iman and Aruba are happy to, to do that. Are you 
definitely, definitely, we're ready. Okay. okay, I think that I think that might be I think that might be the best thing, uh, and then uh, Robin will speak after that, and um, and then we'll have we'll it'll give us enough time for questions before we we break up at one o'clock. Um, so I, I I just want to say how delighted we are um, to to have you with us. Um, uh, Eman Aruba and, and uh, Shireen. Um, Eman and Aruba are uh, students at uh, the uh, Kinaib College for, for Women in Lahore, Pakistan. And uh, Shireen uh, is an academic there who introduced them uh, to us. And, and Shireen will be there to answer questions as, as, as well at the end. Um, but um, great to have you with us. So. Um, Iman Naruba, do, do go ahead. Thank you so much, Philip. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, um, it feels great to be a part of this conference and you know get some amazing insights from all of you. So racism as structural violence and the case study of, we'll be talking about the case study of British African Caribbean people. Iman Naruba Ali and I will be co-presenting this paper with Iman Iqbal, which is digitally authorized by Mishiri. We will refer to white people as British nation or Britain, who are people with European ancestry, and see black people as the Afro-Caribbean people. Um, so as we have as we have seen that the degrees of racism and racist attitudes in Britain have varied over time. Uh, the history of racism in Britain uh, is connected with the age of colonialism and the vastness of British Empire. In fact, the era of colonial colonialism, if we talk about that, became became one of the reasons for a lot of factors to be utilized. Uh, they included the practice of a slave trade, to evacuate lands from the indigenous populations, the use of the divide and rule policy to polarize the population. So that sort of facilitated the racial discrimination occurring at that time. And in the context of this, the structural changes that were brought about at the end of the uh, Second World War, um, in this paper, we explored how, explored how racism sort of um, as an ideology integrated in the social structures and institutions creating an environment um, that led to racial violence. Um, we will we'll, we'll further focus on the history of racial violence uh, faced by the immigrants in general, while specifically focusing on the Afro-Caribbean people during the Cold War era at the hands of British people. And we aim to establish how an injustice and, and, and uh, violence in a system, um, and uh, violence in a system shapes the uh, social structure in such a way that even the victims eventually become the oppressors by briefly highlighting the status of other migrant races and their treatment at the hands of victims of racial discrimination. Um, so we divided this paper and the presentation into three sections. So first, we will be talking about the structural uh, violence. And the second section, uh, the, in the second section, we will be focusing on the study of Afro-Caribbean presence in the Cold War era. And in the third, we will talk about how that led to the violence, which is of the direct violence and the cultural violence and the structural violence as such against the British Afro-Caribbean and the impact um, in the context of the theory. Uh, so moving on to the theory, we will talk about uh, the theory of structural violence. So structural violence is understood as any practice in which uh, structures like economic, political system, the legal system results in a violation or a harm of an individual or a group of people. So um, this was the term used by Johan Galtung in his article of Violence, Peace and uh, Peace Research, in which he talks about how structural violence is a um, is a negative power of the uh, of the social institutions and the policies that eventually uh, impact affect the social organization among the communities um, that are mar marginalized. Um, so moving on to the, the the features of the conflict model, in which we see how attitude uh, leads to the, uh, the the behavior is the major driver of the behavior, and that sort of leads to the contradiction within the system, and that eventually leads to the violence. So talking about the attitudes, we see attitude as the representation of understanding each other, which is a major driver of behavior, which are the actions that are resulted, which, which results from the attitude towards each other. Um, and this behavior can either be an association or an intimidation. And however, um, the outcomes of all of these interactions can often result into contradictions when the objectives uh, become contradictory or conflicting. Uh, so the three forms of violence that exist in the system, uh, as we see, uh, as we see, are, are direct. Uh, we talk about direct violence in which the subject and the object are distinct, and then structural violence, which speculates that people are deprived deprived from the uh, fulfillment of their basic needs uh, by existing in, in institutional um, and social structures. Uh, and when this form of violence uh, is validated by the interplay of culture, 
it eventually becomes a cultural war. Uh, so, um, in, so moving on to the, the history of the Afro-Caribbean presence during the Cold War era, um, in the next section, we, we highlight how the arrival of, of Afro-Caribbean people in Britain and the problems that they were facing, uh, that they were faced with keeping in view of the social economic status of, of Britain at that time. So with the end of World War II, we know that Britain's economy went into deep recession. And in order to reconstruct the economy, an incursion of immigrants for labor purposes was required, which was essential at that point. And as the Second World War was an important uh, period in the Afro-Caribbean history, immigrants from West Africa and Caribbean arrived to serve in the armed forces in small groups. The events after all after the World War II resulted in a generous influx of Afro-Caribbeans, most, most of which were um, here from the British West Indies and the Caribbeans, as we talk about it. And so the Afro-Caribbeans who were hoping that you know the immigration to the UK would bring about some improvements to their social and economic lives had not anticipated the hostility that uh, they, they eventually become a part of, they become subjected to. Um, so, uh, all right, so, um, so as we see that, you know, by mid 90s, Britain had established a reputation of having the largest number of, of um, immigrants uh, within the, or in, the, in their empire. And the migration event was labeled as the wind rush and as a reference to the empire wind rush, the ship responsible for the, uh, for the, for the migration uh, of the first major group of uh, Caribbeans to United Kingdom in 1948. Um, the arrival of immigrants in Windrush is considered to be a milestone in the British Afro-Caribbean history. We see Empire, Empire Windrush was a troop ship coming from Australia to UK through the Atlantic um, while making a stop at Kingston, Jamaica, so to receive workers who were on leave. Uh, however, the Jama uh, Jamaican newspaper had announced cheap travel on the ship, uh, on the ship uh, for anybody, for anyone who wants to work in the United Kingdom, which resulted in so many of them traveling. So this influx of, uh, for, of a, of a generous amount of immigrants became became very essential in the landmark history in the modern uh, landmark modern history of British Britain. Uh, so keeping in mind the the influx of immigrants set were taken by the governments to discourage and slow down the process. However, at that point there were no restrictions necessary or they were not imposed. Um, and an important thing to note here is that uh, the post war immigration of Afro Caribbean. Um, was facilitated through mul multiple media campaigns run by successive British uh, governments. Uh, but with the arrival of Caribbean immigrants and uh, the, the hospi hus uh, hospitality uh, transition to hostility, and the immigrants faced discrimination at every step of the, way, uh, of the way, from finding jobs to looking for a private accommodation. They were deprived of any social activities that were um, to, uh, to practice uh, any social sort of social activities. And the discrimination faced by the Afro Caribbeans led to a clash between them and the Britons, right? And these were the developments that were leading to transformation of of, of attention into a chaos. Um, and these immigrants uh, had plenty to offer to Britain with their skills and idea, ideas, but were somehow undermined at every step of the way. And that is where the cycle of structural violence against the British Afro Caribbean people began. Uh, and my co-presenter Eamon will further. Uh, Talk about the structural violence against the British Afro Caribbean people and how, um, and we'll give you a better insight about the uh, structural violence that exists within our system are right now in the current time. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Ruba. Um, okay, I will be discussing the last part of the section of this paper that is. So um, the violence against the Afro-Caribbean uh, immigrants began with their experiences in finding a suitable place to live and finding private accommodation that was a huge problem for them. Many of them were forced to move to slum areas with the inherent lack of basic, res basic resources to maintain a lifestyle. While the socioeconomic problems were a major determinant of the Afro-Caribbean role in the British society, what really made life hard for them was the everyday attacks on them by the Britons. These attacks on the Afro-Caribbean started as verbal abuse, and in a very short time, the racial slurs uh, translated into the physical confrontations. There were violent attacks against the Afro-Caribbean people in both the public and private sectors, and by the second half of the 1950s, this violence got riotous. Um, Nottingham at the time had a large population of West Indians and Asians who were subjected to short outbreaks of anti-black uh, black rioting. Um, frequent attacks on individual Afri uh, African Caribbean people were carried out on the street day and out. 
they were uh, deprived from attending the uh, social events the gatherings or even walk freely on streets as the britain would the britain would mob them and chant slogans like go back to your own country or let's get the blacks or uh, let's lynch them so we have three scenarios here uh, the african arabians had no place in the houses of the britons they had no place in the public places or social gatherings and they could not even be uh, safe on the streets without having the britons verbally and physically attacking them so uh, these acts of direct violence had become a uh, common practice in society and so did the general uh, acceptability for them galton highlights the role of direct violence that paves the way for cultural and structural violence to take place therefore these riots and the hate speech against the african caribbean population translated into a structural problem now while all of this was happening sensationalization of these events by the media was also partly responsible for prolonging the critical anti black uh, black riots in london uh, in 1958 there were different gangs at the time who would roam around in streets to find west indians africans or asians to tease them and make it difficult for them to even walk safely and the law enforcement agencies at the time were not free of prejudice they ignored these attacks when they could and avoided taking action to stop them which led to this violence increasing day by day i'll uh, mention an incident here that took place in july when five britons targeted a cafe but were set free after paying a very small compensation now uh, not only were these people getting away with what they were doing but they also blamed the african caribbeans for causing these incidents they were uh, blaming their uh, on their circumstances since it was an easy way out for them to justify this cultural violence the media uh, sensationalized these entire uh, this entire situation and that led to more such attacks the rising violence against the people with dark skin had increased to the point where they felt forced to adopt uh, violence as the last means of defense and that led to a pre uh, preemptive attack on a local club where the a plan of an attack on the african caribbeans was under development but even this defensive attempt couldn't stop the racist attacks they continued and spread throughout the london um another incident that i would like to mention here is the murder of the west indian carpenter uh, keslo cochrane cochrane's murder was not found and in a very short time it turned into a pattern in which the areas where the african caribbeans had settled become unsafe for them with the hidden run attacks okay among the very first people to understand these problems were tom driver the chairperson of the labor party who explained this problem uh, as not black skin but the white prejudice he realized that it was the surrender to the prejudice by the britons because it the problem had internalized by that time this white prejudice was not just uh, limited to direct violence but had translated itself as a part of the system by legitimizing the cultural violence now i'll i'll move to the Co commonwealth immigrant act of 1962 Uh, that put restrictions on the immigrant uh, immigration rights that the british nationality act of 1948 had granted uh, granted to the commonwealth citizen uh, it was seen as a brutal act like, by not just the afro caribbean community but also leaders like uh, hugh getskill the labor politician who referred to it as a cruel and a brutal anti color legislation but the important thing that needs to be highlighted here is that where labor party uh, labor one act as anti color legislation At the same party when the uh, when they came in the government initiated its amendment into the 1968 Commonwealth Immigration Act, which further reduced the rights of the migrants. And then under the um, Conservative government in the 1970 in 1971, the Immigration Act was passed as the third amendment of the 1962 Commonwealth Act. Uh, it put more restrictions on immigrations, but uh, it, this time this act uh, came with the introduction of the right of a vote that gave the british citizens and some certain commonwealth citizen who had connections to uk before um, 1984 the unrestricted right to enter and live in uk now um coming to the politicization of this discrimination okay it's needless to say that racism was being highly politicized at the time and this politicization was especially common during the general election of 1964 um racial slurs were a part of the election campaigns like this one instance involving the notorious slogan that some of you might remember or know about used by the tory candidate for the towns of smethwick in the same year the conservative politician eno powell gave the famous river of blood speech in which he showed his concern over immigration to uk and how it could result in bloodshed even after he was removed to from his from the shadow cabinet for the hateful views 
uh, the workers, uh, many workers from that party went to on strike to show their solidarity with Paul. So um, while everything was in a chaotic state, one remarkable development in the 1970s was the was that black became a mark of pride as black is beautiful uh, as a result of the movements outside of Britain for the empowerment of black people and as a response to the internal increasing intolerance among the Britons against, the, uh, against other races. But again, it was not enough to solve a problem that was becoming part of the structure. The institutional racism was prevalent at that time, especially with the sus laws being used as a tool against the afro caribbean It was a stop and search law that gave police the right to uh, the power to arrest a person or people if they're suspected to be involved in a criminal offense. In the 1970s, when um, there was an increase in the number of incidents of mugging, and as one would expect, the Afri uh, African Caribbeans once again become a major target of the suspicions. This violence, the social economic problems heightened with recession uh, and increase in unemployment in the wake of the uh, industrial disputes that were taking place in the 1970s and 80s. The uh, unemployment rate among the, among the Afro Caribbeans was four times higher than the Britain. The Afro Caribbean people were suffering, and along with many agonizing incidents, there was this one incident that, uh, that involved fire at a birthday party in New Cross in 1981 that killed 13 young Afro Caribbean people. The incident was seen as a racist massacre and resulted in a protest against the lack of concern over the situation by, uh, by the media, the police, and the politicians. So uh, this protest was famous. Uh, it was a very famous milestone in the Black British history, and later came to be known as the Black People's Day of Action. Another incident, tragic incident, another very tragic incident of this de decade was the Broadwater Farm riot that resulted in the death of Cynthia Gerard, an afro caribbean woman who had a heart attack when four police officers raided her home uh, in the search of, sto uh, of stolen property. This incident took place uh, right a week after the shooting of Dorothy Gross, another afro caribbean woman, in a very similar search process. So this led to chaos when the black people retaliated against the police brutality and the incident resulted in the death of a police constable, Keith Blakelock. The Home Secretary at the time, who was um, William Whitelaw, he commissioned a report that addressed racial discrimination and disadvantage as the root causes of violence and disturbance which our theory had, uh, sorry, Galton's theory had already established. So this was the stru uh, structural violence of the system that was implicitly endor uh, endorsing this racism. Now, um, the culture of the violence becomes horizontal and as an impact, the minor communities start treating each other the same way the majority does. The same thing was happening in Britain as an impact of the violence that systemized itself and uh, as a result, even the people of African origin started treating other outsiders the same way they had been treating, uh, been treated, thinking that it was allowed and it was acceptable. So uh, this inherent violence that was taking place in Britain, which the African eventually became a part of, led to a cycle of structural violence um, in which the victims too started uh, adopting the ways of their oppressors as a means to survive in a violent system. Uh, the Asians who came to Britain couldn't uh, incorporate themselves in the society because of the language barriers and the time that they took in adapting to the British ways and learning the language. Uh, this was a time that made them an easy target for the attackers. It was significant to note that it wasn't always the Britons that attacked them, but other minorities were involved too. One example of this is Paki bashing as um, the violence against South uh, Asian people in general and Pakistanis in particular. Uh, and the incidents involved not just the Britons, but other minorities too, including the afro Caribbeans. Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't find uh, enough data to elaborate on this issue. Uh, but I would like to um, share a quote that George Marshall shared in his book, uh, quoted in his book, uh, sorry, George Marshall um, in his book, Skinhead Nations, quoted uh, Chris Freed, uh, who was a famous skinhead of that time. He said that um, it wasn't just white kids bashing Asians. Um, it was everybody, uh, everybody bashing everybody to be the top dog uh, in the street, and uh, he believed that Asians were the ones who uh, came out the worst because the media picked up on that and gave it a lot of publicity. So um, I think that makes a good example of th this impact of structural violence that we are trying to explain here. Um, okay, now I'll quickly conclude it. I believe we have taken a lot of time. So um, with multiple minorities in Britain, the insecurity that was resulting from the conflict of interest was not just the problem of the Britons, as the structural theory of Galton points out, how the contradiction 
driven the, uh, by the behaviors and attitudes they uh, lead to the direct violence in the form of attacks hate speech uh, lynching that was that was not the only threat uh, only a threat to the afro caribbean people but soon uh, integrated itself into the culture and system in in such a way that eventually led to not just the confrontation between britons and afro caribbean but everyone that was a part of that societal structure and system regardless of their uh, racial or uh, ethnic background i'm not talking about um, the contemporary situation the status of racism in britain is not ideal even now even though um, it's not as bad as it was during the cold war but it is there um, but we have a, a rise in awareness among the masses in not just britain but all over the world so um, there's still hope that structural violence can be rooted out uh, from the system okay that's it uh, thank you i'll thank the you next panel slide has the references if anyone wants to see that that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was a wonderful overview, and I'm sure it'll raise a lot of questions. Um, Thank you. So I'm going to uh, ask uh, Robin Bunce to give the, the final presentation of this session. And after Robin has spoken, we'll have questions. Uh, so do, as I said before, use the chat uh, facility to ask questions as they occur to you. Robin. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be part of such a fantastic panel. Um, David obviously talked about the period 1890 to 1912. Um, Keisha, you were talking about the 1930s and Ellie was talking about the 1950s. Um, Arun, Aman, um, Shireen, you took us almost up to the present day, almost up to the 1980s. And it's the 1980s, the middle of the 1980s that I want to pick up, pick up at. Um, so I'm starting on the 12th of June, 1987, when Paul Boateng was the first of four black sections candidates to win election to the Commons. Addressing a jubilant crowd, Boateng, Bo Boateng proclaimed, there are some of us who have been waiting 400 years for this result, 400 years. Yet in a moment of triumph, um, there was no triumphalism. Adelaide Tambo was one of Boateng's guests at the count. Together with her husband, Oliver Tambo, the deputy president of the ANC, the couple were living in exile in London, and with, with Tambo next to him, Boateng recalls um, he was well aware that the struggle against racism was ongoing and was global. Um, with this in mind, his famous statement, today Brent South, tomorrow Soweto, reflected the global aspirations of black sections and the global nature um, of white domination. Boateng was one of four black sections candidates um, to win election to the Commons in 1987. Together, he, Diane Abbott, Bernie Grant and Keith Vaz changed the face of British um, um, politics for good. Television cameras were not permitted in the chamber in 1987, but in June um, of 1986, um, um, Mendoza's painting, The House of Commons, um, gives an indication of what um, Parliament looked like at the time. Abbott, Boateng, Grant and Vaz entered the House at a time when the Commons was wholly white and almost entirely male. Um, their victories were the first fruit of the Black Sections Movement. Founded in 1983, um, the demand for Black representation throughout the Labour Party was opposed by white activists and by many white activists and by much of the white media, um, which understood racism through the lens of apartheid as a form of legally entrenched um, segregation. Black radicals had a different perspective on South Africa and on the apartheid regime, and also argued that British racism had much more in common with forms of colonial domination found in the Raj. Um, this paper explores different understandings of racism and anti-racism in Britain through an analysis of the debate over black sections in the Labour Party in the period 1983 to 1987. So I want to begin um, with um, some comments about the origins of black sections. The campaign for black sections emerged in the summer of 1983. It built on the ongoing post-war campaign for black representation in and around the Labour Party. David Pitt was a pioneer, standing for Labour in Hampstead in 1959 and in Clapham in 1970. He was beaten by the Conservatives on both occasions. The Standing Conference of Afro-Caribbean Asian Councillors, SACARC, um, was another initiative which um, kind of grew into black sections. Um, it was formed in South East London by Russell Prophet, Phil Seeley, um, who were Labour councillors in Lewisham and Brent respectively. 
Born in Georgetown, British Guyana in um, the 1950s, uh, Prophet moved to London in the 1960s where he became involved in student politics and latterly in the Labour Party. Having become a councillor in, um, the, in Lewisham in the mid-1970s, Prophet recalls being frustrated with the lack of action on equality issues um, in local government and therefore um, reached out to other black and Asian councillors, um, forming um, Sakak. Um, a fortnight before the 1979 election, Sakak issued the Black People's Manifesto, which set out 16 demands representing the interests of Black and Asian voters. And members of Sakak, as I've said, uh, went on to play a leading role um, in the campaign for Black sections. While Profit was organising um, in South London, Ben Bousquet um, was working along similar lines um, north of the river. Um, born in St Lucia, Bousquet um, had arrived in Britain in 1957 um, at the age of 18. And by the late 1970s, he was a Nalgo shop steward in Charing Cross Hospital um, and a Labour councillor in North Kensington. Together with Labour councillors um, Ray Filbert and Bill Poe, um, Bosquet um, established a caucus, which he argued would create um, the proper atmosphere, as he put it, to support black people in the Labour Party, encourage black people to join the Labour Party and advance a black agenda. In the winter of 1982, Busquet, um, Philbert and Poi expanded what they were doing. Um, they wrote to every black and Asian councillor in the country um, to invite them to um, participate in this caucusing initiative. Um, although um, the three were working in the Labour Party, um, their letter went to all members of Sakak and therefore to the, um, the small number of conservative and liberal and independent councillors who were part of that organisation. At the time of the 1983 election then, there were a variety of organisations working inside the Labour Party and outside the Labour Party, um, all fighting for black representation. Notably, none of these organisations um, were advocating the agenda which later became central to black sections. So although their work laid a foundation for black sections, properly speaking, black sections really only emerged in 1983. The 1983 election gave further impetus for the campaign for black representation. Labour had gone down to its worst defeat since 1919. Significantly, the Runnymede Trust's analysis of the election indicated that the black vote had been crucial in preventing a Labour whiteout. Sorry, wipeout. Um, Narinda McKenji, who you can see on the screen there, um, who'd moved from Zimbabwe to Britain um, and joined the Labour Party um, in 1975, explained... Um, and this is a quote from him, um, the black vote was fairly solid for Labour in 1983. If the black vote had collapsed to the SDP and the Tories in the way that the white working class vote had collapsed, Labour would have been definitely been the third party. We would have probably lost another 30 parliamentary seats at least. And if Labour was going to be the third party, defections to the SDP would grow because very often black people were voting anti-Tory. The Rani Mead Trust's analysis indicated that out of Labour's 8 million voters, um, 1 million came from Black and Asian voters. Although the Rani Mead Trust's figures showed that the Labour's share of the Black and Asian vote had slumped from around 90% in 1979 to around 70% in 1983, this decline was nothing compared to the collapse in Labour's white working class vote. McKenzie argues that the Runnymede Trust's analysis of the 83 election persuaded a number of Black and Asian activists um, that Labour needed to stop taking Black and Asian voters for granted and accept that Black and Asian uh, members should exercise power within the Labour Party. The Running Meads Trust analysis was not the only impetus behind um, the formation of black sections. Diane Abbott, a child of, of Jamaican immigrants, um, Cambridge University history gra graduate, and by 1982, a councillor in Westminster, argues that black sections emerged as the result of broader social and political changes. First, Abbott argues that black sections reflected the aspirations of a new generation of black activists. Um, these were the activists who had marched with Darkus Howe and the Race Today Collective on the Black People's Day of Action that we heard about just now and witnessed um, the insurrection in Brixton. They had seen the desire for justice and power in um, this new generation. So the group who came together to form Black Sections, Abbott argues, were, with a few exceptions, part of this new generation, which wanted to move from protest to power. That is to say, moving from achieving their goals um, through um, pressure from without authoritative institutions to exercising power within authoritative, within existing institutions. So that's the first reason Abbott gives. Secondly, Abbott argues that black sections came about because of a change in the Labour Party at a national level. And here I'm gonna pick up on what was said in the previous paper about immigration acts. 
Harold Wilson and James Callaghan had treated immigration as a matter of electoral expedience rather than a matter of moral principle. This had alienated young black voters. And Labour's swing to the left in the early 1980s led to an upsurge in black and Asian membership of the Labour Party as it signalled the era of Callaghan and Wilson was over. Efforts to democratise the Labour Party, spearheaded by Tony Benn and the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, also persuaded black people to join the Labour Party in the hope that they would exercise real power within the newly democratised structures of the party. Finally, and this is the third reason that Abbott gives, Abbott argues that black sections reflected changes in the London Labour Party. Historically, Labour activists, she argued, had been sympathetic to black rights as conceived as anti-racism in theory, but saw no reason why um, black people should lead the fight for racial justice in practice. However, from the early 1980s, radicals associated with Labour briefing, radicals particularly such as Jeremy Corbyn and Ken Livingston, um, and other people working in the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, um, who were in the ascendance in the London left, supported black self-organisation. Consequently, black activists could um, be sure of support from uh, the dominant or increasingly dominant faction in the London Labour Party when they um, first launched their demands. Although black sections had the support of the London left, activists involved in the movement came from across the party. Profit, for example, was regarded as a moderate. Sharon Atkin, um, who we can see here, was regarded as a radical. Keith Faz, who became involved in black sections around the time of the 1984 European elections, argues it was never about policy. At the start, it was about representation. Um, what is more, um, Influential groups on the left, such as Tribune and Militant Tendency, did not support black sections. So the new formula, so the new form, so the new formation, black sections, did not map onto existing divisions between left and right. Conversations between black and Asian councillors in Profit and Busquets networks led to the foundation of the black, sec of black sections in the summer of 1983. Their first meeting took place in Chippenham Road, Labour's office in North West, or sorry, Westminster North, where Diane Abbott was based. Um, the meeting led to the foundation of the Black Section Steering Committee. Abbott was one of three black women from across um, England on the 17th Strong, 17 Strong Committee. I want to talk now about the campaign against black sections. So black se the black sections campaign exposed a great deal about understandings of race in the Labour Party. Um, black sections took their demands um, for constitutional rec constitutionally recognised sections um, with guaranteed representation at all levels of the Labour Party to the 1983 Labour Party conference, citing the precedent of women's sections and the Labour youth section. Um, the resolution for black sections, however, was not put to a vote. Rather, the conference agreed to establish a working party on positive discrimination, which would make, rep which would make recommendations on constitutional reform at the next conference. Nonetheless, the 1983 conference had re repercussions for black sections that only became clear some months later. The conference um, elected Neil Kinnock as the new party leader, with Roy Hattersley as his deputy. Kinnock was a passionate opponent of apartheid and was, was regarded to, uh, as sympathetic to democratisation in the Labour Party. Equally, although um, the left regarded Hattersley as the standard ba bearer of the old parliamentary right, he represented Birmingham Sparkbrook, where the minority ethnic voters made up more than 35% of the population and where historically as many as 90% had voted Labour. Therefore, it might have been assumed that Kinnock and Hattersley had ideological and electoral reasons for backing black sections. Initially, the new leadership professed an open mind um, on black sections. In April 1984, however, um, the leadership came out firmly against the initiative. Over the course of the next two years, Kinnock and Hattersley made a series of arguments against black sections, reflecting both the political imperatives of the period and broader understandings of race. Significantly, neither advanced a coherent position, and Kinnock, Lee, sorry, and Kinnock and Hattersley disagreed on important issues. Kinnock was the first to oppose black sections in public. His first announcement was rooted in his opposition to apartheid. Speaking in April 1984, he argued, the movement, um, sorry, the moment we move, for whatever benevolent reasons, to, uh, to some form of segregated membership in the Labour Party, that initiative um, is a major regression in our efforts to change attitudes in society and indeed within the Labour movement. The term segregation was routinely used as part of Labour's critique of apartheid in the 1980s. 
He returned to this theme in an open letter published in June 1987, his first systematic attempt to attack black sections. Here he grounded his objection to quote unquote racial segregationists um, in the following way. He argued that while the women's section and the youth section had a clear basis as definitions of age and sex were beyond dispute, black sections could not be founded as there was no clear way of defining black. Consequently, he argued that black sections would, quote, um, create significant problems of racial definition, which would lead only too easily um, to endless unproductive acrimony. Nonetheless, Kinnock argued that he supported increased black membership, the reinvigoration of anti-racist initiatives and measures to increase black representation in the party's decision-making bodies. In short, Kinnock claimed that he agreed with the objectives of black sections, but he disagreed on the methods. Hattersley put out um, his opposition, sorry, Hattersley set out his opposition um, in a speech at the 1985 Labour conference. Like Kinnock, Hattersley professed himself against black sections on principle, arguing that it was an article of socialist faith that all men and women are treated the same. Like Kinnock, Hattersley linked the problem of, um, to a problem of definition. Here he argued that black sections wanted to divide the world in two, quote, the white on one side of the line, the rest on the other. Rejecting the political blackness advocated by black sections, Hattersley insisted that the correct term was not black, but black and Asian British or ethnic minorities. He argued, a group of men and women of very different origins with um, very different cultures cannot be lumped together um, as a generic and vacuously um, called the blacks or the black and Asians. As they do not have the same problems, they do not have the same cultural background and they do not have the same aspirations. Um, to lump the ethnic minorities together in this way is deeply patronizing, um, said Roy Hattersley. For Hattersley, the solution had to be rooted in in the belief that the ethnic minorities, as he called them, um, had essentially the same problems and interests as the white working class. Consequently, Hattersley proposed a black and Asian advisory committee, a group within the Labour Party with no constitutional power, which would be open to all and could advise the party on matters of race. Um, black sections, he argued, focused too narrowly on the interests of black representation, whereas his advisory committee would develop policies in all areas of national life, um, and therefore would be more effective um, than black sections. With this in mind, Hattersley argued that the Black and Asian Advisory Committee would achieve more um, to advance the interests and bring material benefits to the quote-unquote ethnic minorities than black sections. Hattersley argued that although working with ethnic minorities, sorry, Hassley argued that through working with ethnic minorities, white people could learn about the issues facing the black and Asian British and then lead the fight against discrimination as they had in the 60s and 70s when white Labour ministers had passed anti-discrimination laws. Um, although Hattersley's argument um, was different from Kinnock on important points, he too argued in terms of a contrast between the policies which divided black and white and those which promoted what he called a multiracial society. However, his reference, um, sorry, moreover, his reference to a quote unquote color line reflected the language which was used to describe and critique apartheid within the Labour Party. Now for the campaign for black sections. Black sections articulated a different vision of labor in which black people organized themselves and led um, the fight against racism in Britain. In fact, here are the various demands of black sections. Um, which I will not read to you um, but in the interest of time. Um, the campaign for black sections took the issue um, of, or took the critique that they were advocating some kind of apartheid seriously, and therefore um, speakers such as Diane Abbott, who you can see here speaking at the 1984 Labour Conference, addressed that issue. The 1984 and 1985 conferences gave black sections the opportunity to counter the arguments of Kinnock and Hattersley. Abbott, who spoke for black sections at the 1984 conference, argued the actual experience when you set up black sections is far from being a ghetto, far from being apartheid. They draw black people into the party and maximize black involvement. Abbott's understanding of apartheid was quite different from that of the leadership. Concluding her speech, she claimed, we've been accused of apartheid. I tell you what's apartheid, all white parties in multiracial constituencies, that's apartheid, and all white House of Commons, that's apartheid. We, black sections, are providing a remedy for this apartheid. 
Abbott had set out a critique of apartheid in the radical magazine The Leveller in 1981, which helps illuminate her position. Um, reviewing the play Sizey Bans sorry, Sizeway Banzi is Dead, she argued that the problem with many white critiques of apartheid was that they focused on specific legal aspects of racial segregation. This had the effect, she argued, of obscuring the logic of the system and the roots of apartheid, which she identified as being rooted in white racism. Kinnock was guilty of the same. By focusing on the institutional issues around black sections, he had ignored the systematic nature of white racism in Britain. Sharon Atkin, who you can see here on the screen, also addressed the problem of definition and segregation, sorry, and um, apartheid in her conference speech of 1985. Prior to the co conference, she and Abbott had tried to win Kinnock over um, by discussing legal understandings of race, which had underpinned the Race Relations Acts of the 1960s and the 1970s with Kinnock. The discussion got nowhere. Prior to the meeting, Kinnock issued a statement arguing that any definition which took away his right to define himself as black was repellent and um, continued to um, uh, and, and, um, and would simply exacerbate racial divisions in the Labour Party. Unperturbed, Atkin returned to the issue of definition on the conference floor in 1985. She argued, people here say that we don't know the definition of black. Well, I'll address that problem, she argued. Um, the National Front know the definition of black, the police know the definition of black, the Department for Health and Social Security know the definition of black. So why is it that such problems, why is it such a problem for the leadership of our party? Turning to Hatters' arguments, Abbott Atkin and the Black Sections movement more generally claimed that rather than advocating racial equality, Hatters' approach to black people in the Labour Party was essentially colonial in nature. Working with Darkus Howe and Tarek Ali, Black Sections exposed the corruption in Hatters' constituency on Channel 4 days before his conference speech. The Bandung File, a TV programme on Channel 4, revealed evidence that Hattersley relied on the support of local godfathers from the Asian community. These so-called godfathers packed the membership for Hattersley's um, constituency and on some, occasion, some occasions cast votes of fictitious members. In so doing, they were able to keep Hattersley in control of his constituency party. In return, Hattersley prioritised um, the immigration cases presented to him by these so-called godfathers and ignored the requests which came to him through other routes. This relationship then reproduced the patron-client dynamic um, which had been present in British India. Um, moreover, um, it indicated that Hatters' genuine reason for opposing black sections was that he wanted to retain control of his constituency party and not be ousted by genuinely democratic um, uh, black sections. I'm coming to an end, I assure you. Um, Abbott's argument, um, she addressed this in Western Indian World, um, exposed the weakness of Hatters' position and Kinnock's position. Both of these Labour leaders were thinking on it in terms of a simplistic distinction between integration and segregation. Abbott pointed out that integration was more problematic. Um, black sections were an attempt to integrate from a position of strength um, rather than to integrate in, as part of a client-patron um, relationship. In conclusion, the debate around black sections exposes ongoing issues uh, in British politics, what Professor S. Said has described as the paradox of anti-racism. Labour was a party in which everybody deplored racism and a party in which racism persisted. For Hattersley and Kinnock, anti-racism was compatible with one, white people defining what was meant by black, two, white people defining the real interests of black people, three, white people dictating the methods by which black people should achieve their goals. For black sections, anti-racism was only possible in a context where black people organized themselves, black people articulated their own demands, and black people led the fight for racial justice. These debates over, um, and these confusions over racism and anti-racism over terms such as integration and segregation are very much part of our contemporary politics. In that sense, the debate over black sections um, with its appeal to apartheid and colonialism set the template for discussion of racism in Britain to this day. And that's me done. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Um, it's... it's um, it's always slightly mortifying when you've actually lived through the history. I mean, this was all happening uh, just as I was becoming kind of interested in, in, in politics. And um, 
so it it I, I, it, it it resonates tremendously, and it was a it was, it was a great um, presentation. You're very kind. I'm going to I'm going to feed in some of the some of the questions on on chat. Um, so there's a question from Robert Gifford to um, Kesua. Um, uh, very interesting talk. You've highlighted the links with the Communist Party internationally and the ILP in the UK. Um, were other political parties as active in the 1930s? And um, uh, where does the uh, Manpower Citizens Association fit, for example? And, and just, um, I'm just gonna follow that on with uh, a question from Salim Barry um, to uh, Kesua and also to Eli. Um, do the, the workers and decolonial movements you've talked about connect to uh, decolonial, I suppose, colonial nationalist anti-capitalist movements in Africa um, as, as well as the West Indies? So um, Kesua, do you want to start with that? So thank you for the question. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was great to be on a panel with so many kind of connected presentations with all yeah. really interesting. Um, I love what say. So thanks to the panelists. Um, Manpower Citizens Association, as I understand it, is a trade union uh, which operates in Guyana in the 1930s and 40s. It is not a political party in the pure sense of the word if we're talking about the same organization. Um, it's very much a trade union, an early trade union, um, and it speak, it's set up um, in conjunction with Hubert Critchlow, who is a key pioneering figure of Guyanese trade, union, union, ah, trade unionism, um, as he tries to attempt, as he attempts, after having organised the Afro-Guyanese Afro workers, to have Indo-Guyanese workers also organised. Um, so yes, the manpower does have a connection to the International African Service Bureau because Hubert Critchlow was connected to them through the International Communist Movement um, and they are connected to him. I don't know much more than that in terms of the link between them. In terms of other organisations um, in the UK, is the question asking sort of are there other groups? Because yes, the IASB is just the one I focus on the today for the sake of this presentation um, and because that's kind of where my research is. But there are groups like the League of Coloured People, which is probably the most prominent organisation at the period, uh, which is based in London, um, headed by Harold, Harold Moody, who's a VP in Peckham, originally from Jamaica. Uh, there's also, um, wow, just having a little blank there. Uh, there are others. Uh, this is not by any means the only organisation of its type. Um, but it's perhaps the most radical. It also contains figures that go on to do quite important things in the independence period. And so a lot of people trace um, later movements and later figures to the IASB, and that's why it's kind of quite interesting as well. And it's definitely among, if not the absolute most radical. Okay. Ellie, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, sure. So is this the question, um, do workers in decolonial movements um, that we that myself and Kessler talked about connect to um, decolonial anti-capitalist movements in Africa. So um, I don't know of any, and that's partly just through I'm not having done the research. I don't know of any um, connections to specific um, kind of movements in Africa, but I do know that so the Western Indian Gazette and I think the Workers and Students Association were at least aware of and kind of supportive of um, kind of the, uh, similar movements um, that were happening in, in Africa for African uh, liberation, for example. Um, and I guess, so I guess, I mean, those those movements, so the, so the Gazette and um, the Workers and Students Association were definitely part of a um, kind of global, like anti-imperialist, um, kind of pan-Africanist in, in a way um, kind of movement that was happening globally. So there were definitely, there were 100% kind of those connections. Um, but yeah, I don't know about any kind of direct um, connections between movements here and, and specific kind of movements um, in parts of Africa. I don't know. 
um, Kasra, if you have anything more to add to that, if you know more. Yeah, uh, for the, definitely in the 1930s. Um, so what happens in after the Second World War is the 1945 Pan-African Congress, which David actually touched on a bit. Um, and that conference uh, is really around kind of putting together one of the kind of big conclusions it said is that a manifesto for decolonization has made. The ISB members I've talked about were connected to the Caribbean because of my research is, but the ISB also had African members. The founder really was uh, Ita Wadis Johnson, who's a trade unionist from Sierra Leone. There's uh, Jomo Kenyatta, who becomes the first president of uh, Kenya, uh, who's one of the key members. Uh, later on, there's Peter Abraham, who's a writer from South Africa. There is uh, Nandi Ezekwe, who's a Nigerian. A nationalist who's very prominent after the in the decolonization moment and there are a few others whose names i'm sorry are escaping me at the moment but the isb is not a caribbean organization um, i talk about the caribbean side of it but it's very much connected to uh, africans it's led but it's a collective as well so though george put is sort of the leader there's very much a sense that they're all sort of leaders within that also i want to add um they're very, very, they're, they're as much interested in Africa, and actually, after the first, second world war, more interested in Africa than the Caribbean. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah is going to be one of the big figures that comes out of this group, and he's a very close associate of George Padmore, um, and is very much advised by George Padmore later on, right up until the moment of uh, independence um, and, and beyond. Uh, George Padmore moves to Ghana after independence in 1957, I don't want to get the date wrong. Um, so yes, they're very much connected to Africa, and they have very strong connections to Africa. The ISB that I talked about earlier. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, a lot of people are posting uh, comments uh, on chat, which are, are, are very interesting. But um, if some of you could kind of frame those into a question for uh, one or more of the speakers, um, that would be that would be very helpful indeed. Um, while I'm waiting for that, just for, can I? Go back to to Robin, um, Robin's paper. Um, you know, again, kind of having lived through those debates in in the eighties, um, I guess one of the things that that one might want to talk about more was the you know because it. Uh, some of the things that Hattersley and Kinnock said now about those uh, uh, movements, you know, might seem outrageous. Um, but there was a real fear in the leadership about the way in which the Tories were weaponizing this. And of course, there's a famous um, election, Tory election poster showing a person of, um, Afro-Caribbean, I mean, a black, a black man saying, Labour says he's black, the Conservatives say he's British. Um, could you say a little bit more about that, about how that played within the sort of the broader electoral politics of the time? And certainly. The, the right wing I mean, tabloids took that up. Um, certainly. And Philip, you anticipated um, there was a missing part of my talk um, okay. because I was overrunning, so I cut it out. But yes, I, I addressed that there. So Neil Kinnock um, received a report in the um, winter of 1983 from Marion Fitzgerald, and the report was entitled Political Parties and the Black Vote. Um, what she argues in that is that the Tories do not need to run a racist campaign because um, all Labour needs to do is make positive noises about multiculturalism or positive noises about uh, racial justice. And um, voters will then be allowed, can then conclude um, from Tory silence on those issues that if they, you know, if, they, if, they're, if they're racist voters, they can vote for the Tories. And this is what Marion Fitzgerald argues that the Tories did in 1983. They allowed voters to, racist voters to conclude that they were safe to vote Tory. Um, and um, what was I going to say? So Kinnock begins his tenure as leader, believing that um, if Labour is too vocal on black issues or too vocal in favour of racial justice and racial equality, that they will be penalised. Um, the next thing that happens um, after um, that is published is about a year later, black sections run a candidate, um, a, the official Labour candidate in Enfield South, um, and that is a guy called Peter Hamid. Um, and 
the Labour vote is absolutely decimated. Um, and the, the conclusions that are reached at the top of the Labour Party, and, and I've been through Neil Kinnock's archive on this, the conclusions that are reached at the top of the Labour Party is that white working class voters will not vote for black candidates. Um, and therefore, it's considered to be at the top of the Labour Party that, that black candidates will be a net vote loser. And that is also the conclusion that Marion Fitzgerald um, reached in her um, in her um, in her report to Neil Kinnock in the end of 1983. So yes, absolutely, Neil Kinnock. The part of my speech, my the part of my talk which was missing, was looking at the the real the, the kind of gr the the electoral politics of the issue um, and the way the media played it. And you're quite right, the media really hammered Labour on this issue. Um, so yeah, so underneath the, the appeals to high principle, um, there is this electoral calculation going on all the time. Thank you very much. Um, we've still got time for, for more questions, so please um, use the chat or if you want to kind of come in, uh, just uh, uh, raise your hand. There's um, a, um, a message from um, Kali um, to everyone. Speaking as granddaughter of Cynthia Jarrett, I'd be interested to know if there's been any studies on the impact of the subsequent generations of the victims' relatives of these racially motivated incidents. Would anyone like to come in on that? Uh, yes, Philip, I would yeah, like to. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, so um, Kelly, there is data available on the socio-emotional developmental problems and the high rate of traumatic disorders among the African Caribbean generation. I, I think it is divided in three waves. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have an exact set of data available. Um, by the way, as the granddaughter of Cynthia, would you like to share anything about her experience or yours with us? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kelly, we really would request you to comment because, you know, whilst doing this research, I think this was one of the most important things for us to be uh, to be able to hear from people who have been uh, going through all of this. So could you please uh, give us a comment on that? Kelly, if you'd like to, if you'd like to come in, um, just, just uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, speaking now. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry, I put my my full name up there. Um, thank you for that. Um, I didn't come prepared to speak at all, actually. Um, this was just a question that's been quite a lot long-lasting family conversation actually about um we wondered if some of the impacts that we've experienced as a family in the generation her, in her children's generation and her grandchildren's generation had been felt in other families um and you know just wanted to know if there were any studies out there being done but i can say yes obviously the trauma lives on um and it is quite deep-seated um even at her grandchildren's level. Um, so it would be, I'd, I'd love to, to hear more about that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have much knowledge um, right. about this. But, um, it's, it's great to hear from you, Kalinda. Thanks for, thanks for joining us and thanks for the, thanks for the question. Um, yeah. so there's, um, um, sorry, Phil, if you want Shireen, to- you want to come in, yeah, Shireen, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that I believe that there are several studies that are being done, for, you know, generation after generation as to the kind of situation that people have been in. And that is why it becomes really interesting for us to discuss the factors of direct violence and then cultural violence and then structural violence, because structural violence is something which has found um, a lot of deep roots in society. And this is exactly what we, um, you know, even as a society, we need to eradicate so that a certain level of equality can be achieved. So yeah, I believe that whatever happened in the in the decades of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s has has uh, sort of brought along a lot of awareness as to how how people should be treated in general and how the uh, African communities or the Afro Caribbean communities should have been treated or should be treated in the future. So I think um, we're sort of getting there, but. Um, but the process is slightly slow in comparison. Thank you very much. Shreen. Thank you so much. Um, there's there's um, a question um, from uh, from Robin to to David, and I'm going to follow that with a 
with a kind of a broader question, which David can start with. Um, and, and then I think, but I think it applies to really all, all of the papers. So Robin asked David, did the upsurge in utopian literature in 1880 to 1914 influence the development of Pan-Africanism? So that's, that's something specifically for, for you, David. But there's, there's this broader question from um, William Marker um, to everyone. Um, I wonder if presenters would comment on the changing notions of blackness or African identities in the 20th century and the degree to which these notions are determined by responding to external struggles or internal ideas. That's a, that's a huge question. I think it would um, apply to all of the, the paper givers. So, um, David, do you want to kick off on that? Thank you, Robin. Um, I wonder what you mean by utopian literature. Robin, would you like to explain what you mean by utopian literature? Do you mean H.G. Wells and... Um, um, yes, I do mean H.G. Wells, but I also mean um, Bellamy. Um, looking backwards, I'm also thinking about W.E.B. Du Bois's um, The Comet um, and uh, Sutton Griggs's book, um, Imperio Imperium. Um, so yeah, all, uh, shall, yeah. Uh, those kind of things. Right, thank you. Um, I didn't mention Du Bois, partly because Du Bois actually paints himself as being responsible for the Pan-African Conference of 1900. He couldn't even remember. Uh, slightly later on, William's name and some of the other people who were prominently involved in it. So I left him out on purpose because I thought he'd given himself enough coverage, um, often falsely. Um, and there were other people who were much more significant in the ordering and organisation and the presentation of that early Pan-Africanism than, than Du Bois. Du Bois is, of course, a, a significant figure, and he's talking about in Pan-African terms at the Atlanta Conference in 1895. Um, as to the utopian writers, it's an interesting question and I don't think I have an answer. I mean, what I have focused on um, elsewhere and collected quite a lot of material is novels that look at black people that were written between that period, approximately 1880 to 1914. You could take as bookends, I suppose, something like um, a Ryder Haggard novel in 1883 and Prester John uh, in 1910, I think it is. And between those, you've got this image of who Africans are, and particularly Africans who have got what was referred to as the thin veneer of European civilization. So that there are a collection of novels that paint Africans who are usually having a relationship with a white woman that they've met on a boat going back to Africa and they've become engaged to the woman. But as soon as they come near to Africa, their simian nature takes them over. And uh, uh, whether they've been to Cambridge and Heidelberg and uh, are qualified medical doctors, that's got nothing to do with it. It's this sort of inbred idea of their that simian nature, that they want to be back swinging in the trees and so on. It, it's an appalling um, collection of novels um, that uh, I think from the 1880s through to about 19, 1912. Um, but the utopian ones I've not read in that light and the ones that I have read, um, I don't think actually say very much. The only novel or fictional account that I did quote was um, the one by uh, Casey Hayford, uh, Utopia, uh, Ethiopia Unbound, which in a sense you could say is utopian and it looks forward to a Pan-African world. So for, for utopian read, offensively racist, um, it seems. Uh, yes. Um, and the, the kind of the, the black, uh, this question of black identities, developing through time in the 20th century. Um, Kisoa, do you, would you like to come in on that? You're muted. No, no, it's fine. I've got myself. Yeah. Um, so the question was from William Acker, who asked about the change in nature or ideas yeah. about blackness in the, in the period that I study. So I look at um, the 1918 to 1948, roughly, um, and I'm kind of focused on the Caribbean. And in that time, there's a huge amount of change that happens. Um, at that time, you were going from a period where 
people have, um, well, the 1930s, as my page was talked about, it's kind of a big change uh, for the Caribbean and it changes it and it, it's gonna, never going to go back. Um, at that time, uh, I've mentioned in my paper, but I didn't go into it, that the, the, oh, excuse me, the Ethiopia Solidarity Campaign um, as being a kind of trigger of the labor rebellions in the English speaking region. And part of that comes from the fact that Marcus Garvey's uh, Pan Africanism has been a huge influence in the 1920s in the Caribbean. And um, people in both in the Caribbean and in Europe uh, are, are huge, are kind of ad are adherents to some of his ideas. Um, and in the 1934, uh, sort of beginning of aggression from Italy, uh, Caribbean people are very much active in supporting Ethiopia um, and they organize themselves in quite extraordinary ways uh, when we look back in the throughout 1935. At this time, uh, one of the things that happens, particularly in the English speaking Caribbean, is that British prestige is kind of broken. The fact that it's quite clear that Ethiopia and Italy are equally members of the League of Nations, that Italy is being aggressive, that the League of Nations exists to mediate disputes but refuses to intervene, refuses to sanction Italy, causes no end of disappointment and frustration. There's a really marked difference in the discourses of newspapers written by black people in the Caribbean at the time about people who expect Britain to do the right thing. They, ex they believe in British fair play. They believe that Britain will do the right thing. It will do the right thing. And it becomes increasingly apparent that Britain is very much focused on its own interests and that there is a division there is a line between the interests of colonial subjects and the British imperial government, and that is increasingly apparent. Um, they begin to describe themselves increasingly as African people, and people who are, are, who are of the Caribbean, who were kind of born in the Caribbean or raised Caribbean of African descent. And in that way, there's a very clear sense of change, uh, how they conceptualize themselves. I don't necessarily think, however, that that's something that broadens past the kind of group of radicals that I talk about. Um, what does change is the idea of a West Indianness as opposed to being a Barbadian or a St. Lucian. That's another concept that kind of really emerges in this period, um, a sense of being a West Indian uh, rather than just from my particular island. Um, and that is increased in when, we, when we see in the UK after the people start to arrive en masse uh, in the 1950s. So in those two ways, I definitely think I can see changes in the way that people think about blackness. Um, oh, and also Later on, blackness is kind of more adopted, but in the short term, it's more about Africanness, except in a past as a slave of, of and sorry, ancestry that consisted of enslaved people who were African, um, and identifying with Africans uh, definitely. Thank you, Ellie. Ellie would you just come in on that? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's I think this idea of uh, the changing notion of blackness or kind of Af Africanness is. Um, across the 20th century is, is really interesting. And I just want to pick up on something uh, Kessler just said about the, particularly in the context of Caribbean people, um, this increasing um, notion of a kind of West Indian identity in the kind of, um, I guess it kind of increases throughout the, the 20th century, but specifically kind of takes hold in the, um, the kind of 40s and the 50s um, specifically. And I kind of found... It's kind of a question that where blackness kind of fits into that identity is something I kind of ask myself a little bit um, it, in my research. I don't think I necessarily have an answer for it, but I think um, there's almost, you can almost like not trace, but in the like 1930s, um, that in kind of a period that Kessel is kind of speaking about, there was this increasing idea of, um, of a kind of like, transnational or international like African or, or black identity um, at the same point where there was the kind of post-colonial uh, post-imperial ideas were more transnational so there's this kind of like alignment between those identities and the post-colonial um, um, ideas um, but as the kind of 20th century um, goes on and as this kind of overarching narrative of uh, internationalism kind of declining and more kind of ideas about nationalism and the nation state um, taking hold, at least for Caribbean people, I found in my research that the notion of blackness um, became less prominent and there was more of a, a maybe a shift towards a more West Indian a national identity that was more inclusive and kind of maybe needed to be more inclusive because of 
um, I guess the demographic makeup of, of the Caribbean in that in that period. Obviously, there was um, the majority of Afro Caribbean. Um, the Afro Caribbean population was largely the majority, but obviously there were Indian and, and Chinese and kind of Syrian and lots of people with different heritages. So I I found at least when um, West Indian nationalism was kind of coming a bit to the fore, the idea of a uh, of black. Hey, we've lost you. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you lost me. Yeah, you're, you're back. <laughs> um, yeah, I, at least I found in my research that the, as West Indian nationalism started to take hold, the idea of blackness potentially uh, declined slightly. Um, I mean, there's obviously the, that's kind of interesting, that period in comparison to the later period of like the, the late 60s and 70s, where ideas of like blackness and black power then come to the fore again. Um, but you can definitely see, I guess, changes of how this idea and these identities um, how they changed kind of in relation to um, other kind of external factors and ideas of, uh, of nationalism across, across the period. Yeah, th thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, well, I'll ask Sh Shireen and, and then um, Robin also to pick up on this, this broad question about black identities, but just feed into that two related questions. Firstly, the extent to which um, sort of American uh, politics, Amer American kind of race politics. I mean, Ellie mentioned Black Power movement. Is that is that sort of feeding into uh, British British politics um, and the British politics around around race? And also, G. Bowman talks about the kind of the terminology. Uh, so, use of the term black. Uh, use of the term now B A, B -A M E B M E people of color is it, does that is are there debates around terminology say in the seventies and eighties that you come across so should should we first Shireen, you're muted still yeah okay so um, you know when we were coming here to present, uh, the three of us sort of sat down as to what kind of terminology should we actually be using? Because obviously we don't live in the UK or the US for us to know exactly what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And we wanted to be as careful as possible. This is an actual discussion that we had while we were writing the paper. So um, yes, so we did uh, come across a lot of terminologies and um, there, were, there are various ways in which people have sort of been defined over the years. And um, it was sort of surprising to come across so many terminologies just for these people who are essentially humans. And uh, so it was a little odd. And I think I I we realized that um, all these terminologies were sort of politically motivated in one decade or the other. So um, the in end result was that we wanted to we wanted to be uh, you know we wanted to represent this community not based on the kind of uh, any kind of a racial slur or uh, any kind of basic terminology, but we wanted to be as neutral because we thought that uh, um, it's the same for everyone. You go from one country to the other and you sort of get labeled as something or the other. So that's something that we sort of have come across and um, that's something we did sort of deal with while writing the paper. Um, also, as far as the, uh, um, the influence of American politics and everything that is happening in America regarding the Black Lives Matter movement and how that is coming, uh, how that is sort of crossing continents now and is involving a lot of people, I think. Um, I think it's, it's very important because uh, what I've observed is that the uh, movement that sort of sparked in the Americas and then sort of spread out to all these other countries has actually brought a lot of awareness. And that awareness is not restricted to only the Western world. It's also, it's, it's all of, also coming down to all the way to the South. People are now actually debating um, what is happening over there and the kind of experiences that people have, and they want to listen to them. Because um, I think globalization and everything that has sort of brought us together has uh, created a lot, of, a lot of awareness and knowledge about this entire movement and the journeys that these people have had. So I think uh, it's definitely had an impact on British politics as well. And everything that is happening in the West right now, or maybe in the European, in some of the European countries. So yeah, I think uh, probably Robin would have a better insight on that. 
and uh, I'll hand it over to him. Thank you. Robin, thank you. Thank you. I doubt I have a better insight, but um, but what I was going to say um, is simply um, there is a um, there's a clear moment in the 1980s when it becomes important for the Labour leadership to disaggregate the word black and to split it into black and Asian. And one of the other things I was going to say in my in the excised bit of my talk, which I didn't give, was that this was picked. Black sections described this as a strategy of divide and rule. So they they root they saw the strategy of dividing black and Asian as something which has its roots in colonialism and particularly in British colonialism. Um, so yes, yeah, so it seems to me that from 1967 to 1973, so the period of the Black Power movement, there's a clear focus in, amongst the mainstream Black Power movement in Britain on political black. That is picked up by the Race Today Collective and by OAD in the later part of the 1970s. And that is the understanding of, of political blackness, um, which you get in black sections. Um, and yes, it's, a, it's in the middle of the 80s and towards the end of the 80s that Roy Hattersley wants to break that down and say, no, there is no such thing as black in that sense. We're talking about black and Asian. They're different communities and therefore they shouldn't be in alliance one with the other. So, yes, yeah, so that, that's the that's the story that um, I'm, I'm telling in, in the book on Diane Abbott. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're well past one o'clock, but I wanted to keep the, the session going because it was such a fascinating one and such wonderful links between the different, the different papers. And um, I know we, we, got, we had a few teething problems at the, at the beginning, but that's, that's inevitable. But I think um, it's, been a, it's been a fantastic discussion. So thank you all uh, to the, the presenters of our five uh, papers this, this morning. Um, we're going to, we're going to reconvene at uh, two o'clock UK time, so in about, uh, about 50 minutes. Um, we, we'll have a section on new books, and um, so three people will be speaking live, uh, and then we have uh, a couple of uh, recorded uh, interviews to show. And um, then we, we round off in the, in the, in the afternoon uh, with a section on uh, women. Um, but thank you so much again for uh, the, the, the presentations uh, and um, stay with us for this afternoon's two sessions. Thank you very much. See you later. <laughs>